Good morning, everybody. Just give us a second here. We're just getting set up for our uh, our fun morning live stream. Laura's just grabbing her coffee. So if you haven't grabbed yourself a coffee or a tea yet, uh, go and do that right now. And uh, we're going to go on a virtual plant walk this morning. So for those of you that aren't familiar with us, I'll just, oh, that's under the background there. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Gilmore and uh, my wife, Laura, is going to be joining us and we run Wild Muskoka Botanicals. Uh, where everything that we make has something wild forged sustainably from the woods of Muskoka. So that's a big passion of ours. So thanks so much for joining in this morning. Uh, Laura is coming over right now with her coffee. Uh, hopefully you got a nice drink as well. And we'll get started as soon as Laura gets here. Hey, Laura. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So uh, just a quick request. First off, this is the first time Laura and I've ever done something like this, done a, a live stream like this. And it's so awesome to see there's actually some people showing up. So thank you for taking uh, some time. Uh, we're going to probably go for about 20, 30 minutes this morning. And we're going to walk you through uh, five of our favorite and most tasty spring edibles. But if I could just make two quick requests as we're getting going here. Uh, one, if you're enjoying this, if you would mind sharing it, whatever platform, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook watching the live stream, if you're able to actually share this and like it, uh, then it helps more people actually see it. So if you can share and like this right now, that would mean the world to us. And also, if you're able to comment in the comment section, you can actually ask questions there uh, and we're able to pull them up. So maybe just quickly write in the comments where you're coming from this morning uh, and let us know that you're here. And then I'm going to check the questions periodically as we do this. Um, and I will yeah, answer some questions as we go along. Um, one, one last thing before we get going. Actually, Laura, why don't you tell us what, what plants are we going to go over this morning? What's our yeah. game plan? So we're kind of at the tail end of the spring harvesting season. Um, so we're going to cover uh, violets. We're going to cover dandelions, uh, spruce tips, wild leeks, and stinging nettle. Cool. So those are the, the five plants that we're going to cover over the next half an hour here. Um, I just wanted to mention two more things and then we're going to start our, our plant walk this morning. So one, uh, I just wanted to mention, we put together something new for Wild Muskoka that's kind of fun this year. Uh, we've never really done collections before. So as I mentioned, all of our products have something wild, uh, wild forged from the woods of Muskoka. And this year we decided to make a collection for the season. So this is our spring uh, foragers box there. And inside of the Springs Foragers box, uh, actually, why don't you share? I'm, I'm talking about here. <laughs> what, what are four things that they get in the Forager box? So you get two of our infused vinegars, which are so good for salad dressings and marinades. So there's the wild leek leaf and a spruce tip um, infused apple cider vinegar. We use raw organic apple cider vinegar made here in Ontario. Um, it's a good local product. We also have our wild salt. So that is our amazing go-to all-purpose seasoning salt anything you use that in just tastes delicious whether it's just adding it to eggs adding it to soup soup really anywhere where you would add salt and pepper um, and it's got leek leaves in it it's got sweet gale and it's also got the spruce tips so two of the plants we're talking about today and lastly it's got our nettle gamasio so that's good great healthy stinging nettle leaves and a nice rich sesame Awesome. So we're going to go and actually look at some of those plants right now that are in that. But if anyone's interested in the wild foragers box, uh, we're going to, we have a special live stream offer to get 10% off the foragers box. Uh, if you enter the coupon code at checkout wild spring, you'll get 10% off that. Um, and we also have a D Boyer just wrote in the comments. Good morning from Vermont. So thanks for joining us all the way from Vermont. And if you're just tuning in, uh, I'll say this one more time. It would mean the world to us, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. This is our first time trying this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're able to like it and share it so other people know we're live, that would mean the world to us. And if you just know that you can actually put comments, whether on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll actually see them. So if you want to let us know where you're coming from this morning, that would be great. And if you have any questions as we go along, uh, throw them in the comments there and we'll do our best to answer them. But let's get started, though. Uh, right. You want to go check out the spruce first? Sure. Okay. This might be a little bit funny. We're, uh, we're trying to work one phone to have both of us on us, but we're going to walk down to the spruce pit. We're on our, uh, our homestead this morning. So whoa, whoa. our first tree we're going to look at, or sorry, first plant this morning we're going to look at is uh, the spruce tree. And this is in the uh, spruce tip uh, vinegar as well as the wild salt. Okay. So what I'm looking at here, there's actually a large tree, but there's a number of trees growing all together. So this is a white spruce. Um, you can use any spruce tree that grows anywhere in North America. 
Um, so white spruce, one of the ways that I can tell it's spruce is that the needles, the leaves go all the way around the branch, not just on one side. And if I pull an individual needle, it actually, and I roll it in my fingers, it actually has like edges. It feels like I'm kind of rolling something that's square. Um, so those are just a few of the tips on how to identify spruce tree. Spruce tree is like your classic Christmas tree um, that a lot of people get. So the spruce tips are the young growth, the young, basically new shoots of the tree that are growing in the in the early spring. And you can see this is the older part of the tree. So that's the part that's going to be stiff um, and thick, but the young tips are just coming up. So these are about just at the very end of the time that you would pick them. Um, but you could still pick them because they're still soft. You can see the color change difference. This, these spruce tips are like quite like, ooh, there we go, quite bright in color compared to the older, fo older foliage. And they're still tender. So you can still work with them. So things that you can do with spruce tips. So you can pick them. So one thing from a sustainability perspective is I always pick spruce tips from trees that are much bigger than I am. Um, so then I know that I'm not like harvesting from a really tiny tree um, because when you harvest the tips, you are kind of stunting the growth um, of those branches. So you can tip, if you want to do that too, you can just harvest the side um, tips so that you still leave this terminal bud to keep growing. Um, and generally when I'm picking spruce tips, I just kind of randomly go along the tree and just kind of like pick so that I'm not like taking all of the tips that are growing and so i'll just walk around and get like you know a handful like this so there we go so i just harvested really quickly harvested a nice little handful of spruce tips so a week ago when they were small and tight a lot of times people when they see spruce tip pictures they'll be quite small and tight um those that stage is really nice to harvest if you're going to just eat them straight um, so you can nibble on them straight. You can add them to salads. Also, if you're going to pickle them and you want something that's going to hold its form together really well, um, harvesting the really tiny spruce tips are really nice because they're firm at that stage. Um, so a few days later, when they get a little bit bigger like this, you can still harvest them. But these are much softer now. Um, so if you pickle them, you, you still can, but just know that they're not going to be like a firm pickle. They'll be something that's softer. But at this stage, they're still really great for infusing in vinegars, for making a spruce tip salt, for making spruce tip sugar. Um, so those different kinds of um, recipes that you do with them, you can absolutely do with these bigger tips. And I actually like working with the bigger tips because I feel like I, I don't have to brush off the little uh, husks they'll actually get there's one that dropped there's these little papery husks that will be on the very young tips and I, it's nice not have to to sort those out um so i like this bigger size tip um so for making spruce tip vinegar if you want to try to make some on your own uh you can just fill a jar um any size jar you want you know if it's something you've never had before i always recommend to you know, start with a small small jar and just loose pack the tips in there. Just, you don't have to pack them down, just like fill the jar up and then just cover it with apple cider vinegar, let it sit for a month and then strain it out. Um, and you'll get this like incredibly, I guess the flavor of spruce tips is kind of like a lemony flavor because um, they're really high in vitamin C. So you're really tasting that, that lemon. Um, and the apple cider vinegar is so bright and fresh. And I really love using it in like, berry vinaigrettes so mixing it with like blueberry or blackberry like jam and then just a little bit of like oil and making a nice like bright vinaigrette I've also added this one to like um, a, a splash to fruit salads it's like really incredible something really unique and different um, and it's my secret uh, secret ingredient to my peanut sauce so when I make like just a regular you can look up almost any any peanut sauce recipe and they typically call for a type of vinegar and the spruce tip vinegar is just like this incredible magic ingredient in any type of peanut sauce. Um, and then I also will do um, spruce tip syrups. So you can like infuse these in sugar. There's all different recipes you can find online, but I take these and I um, 
will soak like let the sugar sit on them and if you mix this with sugar organic cane sugar maple sugar whatever kind of sugar you like to use um the sugar will actually draw the juices out of the like actually draw the liquid out of the spruce tips and then so if you let it like sit for like a week it just slowly seeps out um the sugar the juices and then you can get this like it'll melt the sugar and create this like really fragrant really delicious syrup um which is so fun to do uh, we do spruce tip sugars and salt which are basically in a food processor we mix equal parts so one part spruce so let's say one cup spruce tips to one cup salt or sugar either one um and grind it till it's just like nice coarsely ground and then the salt we can air dry just on like a baking sheet and the salt will just naturally cure with the spruce tips if you're doing the sugar um unless you want it to turn to syrup uh we will do it in a dehydrator and then you get this like basically spruce tip candy coming out of it which is which is really incredible and i love this tree from a sustainability perspective because there's spruce trees everywhere um, whether you're deep in the bush or if you're in an urban, suburban environment, there's almost always some sort of spruce tree, whether it's, you know, our native white or black spruce, maybe you're in the city and they have Norway spruce or a blue spruce, you can use any species of spruce tree. Um, and the flavors might be just like slightly different, but all of them are going to be relatively the same. And as long as it's a big tree, you can harvest from those same trees year after year. I've been harvesting the same spruce, tri or spruce tips from the same trees for like nine years. Um, so I can definitely attest that the trees can definitely handle and they're, they're still super healthy and vigorous. Um, and spruce trees are very, um, you know, they're, they're easy to access for most people. Um, and there's so many things that you can do with them. So they make a really good, like beginning foraging species to learn. Yeah. Depending on where you live right now, a lot of folks spruce are probably finished for the year. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's worth taking a look around at these new buds because if you can find some of these short ones, like the little guys like that, you still may be able to just chew them up raw. Um, that one there was still delicious. has a nice little lemony zang to it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to walk over. We should just maybe mention too that uh, there's a number of conifers that this works for. Like over here, I don't know if you can see that, we have a white pine over there. Uh, and the white pine buds um, or those little tips coming up as well, those are a great little uh, treat to snack on raw as well. The balsam fir there actually has really nice tips on it right now. You can see these ones are quite nice and still tight. Um, you can absolutely still work with the, the fir tips. Um, so these balsam fir will, will still work. Uh, they also have a slightly different flavor. Um, the one that's important to just to get to know if you're going to be exploring, experimenting with different conifers is just to make sure you learn Canada yew or any type of yew tree because um, yew is not an edible species. But most of our other conifers that grow in Eastern North America have, are edible. Cool. Well, let's walk over to the next plant. Hello, where are we going to go? You want to go up to the violets next? Sure, let's do violets. Okay, we're going to go for a little walk up to the violets. Hopefully you got your coffee there. Uh, if you have not liked uh, this video or shared it yet, uh, we would really appreciate it if you hit the like here on YouTube or hit the like here on Facebook, wherever you're watching. And if you could comment below, the more people that like and comment, uh, the more this will actually show up in other people's streams. So if you're enjoying this, if you could do us a favor and both like and share it right now. And also just know we're taking questions. So there, if you write comments, whether on Facebook or again on YouTube in the comment section, uh, they'll actually pop up on our screen and we're happy to answer some questions for you. So let's move over to our next plant of the live stream, the violets. Hey, I just saw two more likes come in. So thanks for those that are, that are actually sharing here. And we'd love to hear some comments. So let us know if you're enjoying this and um, ask questions. But let's go over to our next plant. Hi. Right. So we're in the very wild area of our lawn. Um, and I do think foraging should begin right at home. So whatever species you have right in your lawn should be the ones that, that you start with. So we had a good deep rain the last few days, um, which I'm really thankful for because we've had a bit of a dry spring. Um, so the plants on the lawn here are a little wet. Um, but violets are one of my favorite early spring plants. So this is the violet plant here. So violets have this heart-shaped chordate leaf. So you can see it's shaped like a heart. And along the edge of the leaf, there's like these kind of little blunt ripples. We call them serrations. So you think like a serrated knife. So they're not super, they're not sharp teeth but they're a little bit blunt teeth. 
And then the flowers, oh, they're a little waterlogged this morning, but they still look great. Here we go, shake it a little bit. Um, so this beautiful asymmetrical flower. Um, so it's got like five petals. And then if you split it, if, if I split it in quadrants, it's not symmetrical all the way around. It's only symmetrical through the middle. Um, and violets will come in all different colors. You can come in white. Uh, we have ones here that are white with purple stripes. We have ones that are yellow. We have ones, there are probably 20, at least 20 different species of violets here in the, my region of Ontario. Um, and every single species of violet is edible. So it's a really good one to know. They're really closely related to pansies um, that people grow in their gardens. Again, an, an early spring flower that people will put out. Um, so they're all in the viola family. So they're, they're a good one to know and they're all edible. Um, you might not necessarily want to eat the pansies that come from like the garden center in the spring, just because for the floral market, they will spray things, spray plants with um, different like pesticides or herbicides that um, aren't really safe for human consumption. Um, but pansies or violets that have been grown organically um, or the little Johnny jump ups, which are the pansies that like rev go wild in people's gardens. Um, you can also eat. So the whole viola family you can eat. Um, so there's some of my favorite spring greens, incredibly high in vitamin C. Um, there was some nutritional analysis done on violets and a third of a cup of violet leaves are actually all of your um, daily vitamin C requirements. So I'll harvest the small tender uh, violet leaves and we add them to salads and just like, I'll just munch on them in the garden. Um, my rabbits also really like to eat them. Um, so they're, they're good spring food. Um, and they also spread really readily, which is just really nice to have something that, um, so even if you introduce it, maybe you're a gardener, you want to do more foraging right close to home. Um, if you get a, a violet plant from someone who has lots, um, you can plant it and then it'll spread and then you get that, that good early spring food source. I'm not allowed to mow most of our lawn anymore because of all the way the violets and the plantain have spread uh, and the oxide daisy. Basically every time I go to mow the lawn, Laura's like, no, no, you can't mow that patch and you can't mow that patch. Not that patch over there either. <laughs> so I basically have to like weave the lawnmower around all of the violets and plantain now, uh, which is great because we, as I said, we nibble on it ourselves. We feed it to the, um, the bunnies. I'm just going to check the comments here and see if we got any questions coming through here. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, someone just said, I'm glad you addressed the balsam trees since I have lots of them. Yeah, the balsams are good edibles as well. Uh, of course, you're going to want to make sure you're 100% accurate with your identification with all of these as we go through. Um, oh, someone just said, we have your spruce tip salt and many of your bitters and we love them. Oh, thanks so much. I'm so glad you enjoy both of those. Um, Brady Campbell. Hey, Chris and Laura, coming in from Eels Lake near Apsley. Yeah, absolutely. What a gorgeous area. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brady. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments about any of the plants as we go through them. We're happy to do that. And if you haven't liked this video and shared it yet, whether on YouTube or Facebook, we'd really appreciate that as well to help more people see it. So share your comments. And should we move over to the leeks next? We haven't even talked about violet flowers. Oh, we're not even there yet. Okay, I thought we were done. All right, we're back to violets okay. a little longer. Here we go. Well, I just at least have to share with the flowers. So these incredible flowers, purple flowers, Again, they could be yellow, white. I really love working with this purple one. So I will make violet syrup. It's pretty much the most magical syrup you can make. So I harvest a bunch of the flowers, steep it in water for one night, 24 hours, and you'll get this electric blue uh, tea. And then I strain out the petals. And then if you add, so if you have one cup of tea, it'll, so doing a syrup, it's one to one. So this is one, the only time of year I use white sugar, but I will add um, white sugar to that electric blue tea. Um, and then if you add, if you do this, especially when you're with someone and you just drizzle like a, like a teaspoon, uh, just a tiny little splash of lemon juice, it turns it from electric blue to electric purple. Um, and it's so fun. Um, and then you get this floral syrup that's electric purple that you can like make drinks from, add soda water, drizzle on cakes, do all different types of fun things. Um, and especially if you're working with kids, it's probably one of the most magical wild foods, um, you know, project you could do together. And then just also eat the flowers, add them to salads, decorate birthday cakes with them, do all types of fun things with them. Awesome. All right, let's keep going here. So 
uh, we're going to go over and check out the wild leek patch next. Uh, and this is kind of a fun one for us because wild leeks, um, they grow in our area, but they don't grow on our property. So we've been practicing something that's sometimes referred to in the modern world as forest gardening, um, where we're actually planting wild native species in the forest, uh, both for the wildlife and for our own consumption. And if you missed the beginning of the broadcast, I just want to mention this again quickly. Um, we integrate the wild leeks into a bunch of the stuff we make at Wild Muskoka. Laura's going to talk about that a little bit more. But we have this cool little, uh, whoa, here, I'll just do it like this. We're calling this our wild foragers box. That's hilarious. That's literally a black fly that just crawled over the screen. Uh, we're in bug season here in Muskoka. So our wild forager box has an infused wild leek vinegar, an infused spruce tip vinegar, if you've missed the harvest on those two this piece, uh, year. And then it also has our, uh, our wild salt, which has wild leeks and spruce tips and sweet gale in it, and our gamasio, which has nettle in it. And we're going to talk about nettle in a moment here as well. But if you're interested in um, some of those things and you missed the harvest season, uh, I'm just going to throw this up on the screen. We've got a coupon. If you enter wild spring uh, at wildmuskoka.com, you'll get 10% off of the wild foragers, uh, the spring foragers box. All right, we're going to go back to Laura here, though, and we're going to chat about wild leeks, which are just about finished for the season here. So I'm going to turn around here and just remember, uh, ask your questions in the comments. If you got questions about any of these plants, we're happy to answer them. Oh, yeah, great. Lewis asks, Laura, how many petals would you pick for the violet syrup? Do you want to answer that before hmm. we go on? Oh, gosh, individual flowers. You, for like a small jar, you might need like 50 individual flowers um and the flowers will keep coming um so the more you kind of pick the flowers the more it stimulates them to produce but yeah you probably need a, a flower i mean in a what i'll say from a patch of violets that's maybe five feet long by about three feet wide that's i think of the section of our lawn so it's a pretty small area that the plants are growing i've been able to make like uh two liters of the syrup because I made it in classes and shared it with friends. So you don't need many plants to actually get quite a bit of, of flowers. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's chat wild leeks next now. So we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of crouch down here. So this is the patch of wild leeks that we've actually, so we went to a spot where there was an abundance of leeks, like literally a massive. Um, they were, this was gonna be where a driveway was gonna be built. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there was a ton of leeks there and they were doing some development there. So these leeks were gonna get destroyed anyway. So we actually dug them up and transplanted them over onto into the forest by our place here. And now we've got a beautiful, healthy leek patch that's starting to form here. So they're a great one to integrate into the landscape if you have the right habitat for it. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Laura to chat about that right now. And if you haven't hit the like button yet, please hit the like mm -hmm. button. That helps more people see what we're doing this morning. Hey, yeah. So right habitat, good place to start. Um, so wild leeks really love to be with maple trees. Um, so sugar maple, red maple, I see them a lot with the sugar maples. Here in the Muskoka region, I typically find them in maple beech forests, particularly if there's a south facing slope. That seems to be the the good habitat, those good sugar bush, uh, sugar maple bushes tend to be good spots for leeks. So the, um, and I've actually friends of mine who have uh, big sugar bush stands where I actually do lots of foraging. Um, I've, I've dug leeks before from like the ATV trails and spaces that um, the leeks would be struggling a bit if I had left them. So um, yeah, so those are good places to transplant them from. They transplant well. So, but also wild leeks are a really important species from a conservation perspective to think about for foraging. Because unlike violets and spruce tips, um, people have over-harvested leeks lots um, in most of the areas that they grow. So they grow from all the way down to their Carolinian species. So they'll grow all the way like south to like Georgia, the Appalachians, um, across to Quebec, um, Ontario. But um, wherever the maple trees grow, basically the same habitat the leeks but a lot of places they've grown um, they have been over harvested Ontario does have a stable healthy population but that can change if people get really excited about harvesting leeks and, and so I should just mention we've seen places in Ontario too where they're totally devastated it's usually like public land often on the side of roads where people just come in and they just take big clumps and sometimes you'll even see they'll drop them and they'll be like bulbs like sitting on the ground that aren't even being eaten now and are dying and I think people just often don't realize how long it actually takes for wild leeks to grow and reproduce. 
um, because they're a slow growing ball, it's really easy to have a negative impact quickly. Uh, so sustainability is really important. And I just want to highlight actually in the, the, there should be in the comment section here, sorry, in the description, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, I put a link. We actually just released a new post uh, and it's a wild leak and ramps harvesting guide. It's totally free and it's on our website. Uh, so if you either uh, go to the, the description and click on the links there for the wild leaks guide, or you just go to our website, wildmuskoka.com, um, you should be able to find that wild leaks guide. And we will go even deeper than we're going to in the live stream today. And we talk about everything from how to harvest them, identify them, toxic lookalikes, uh, and our favorite wild leak recipes are all on that blog post. So you can check that out in the description or over on the Wild Muskoka page. Um, I'll pass it back to Laura, though, to, to keep going on our tour yeah. right now. So wild leeks are a spring ephemeral plant. So what that means is they only grow for a short period of time in the spring. Um, so typically, one of the easiest ways to find wild leeks is in the early spring before the trees have leafed out, before any of these other green plants are out, wild leeks are the first thing. And so when I first go out in like early May to look for these guys, uh, there will be nothing else in the forest growing but these stands of leeks. So that makes it easy, easy to find them. And then they also have a very strong onion garlic smell. Um, so, and then once the trees leaf out, these plants actually start to die back. So if Chris looks closely at, at these leaves, they're actually starting to, they're not as vibrant and healthy looking as they looked a few weeks ago. And then you can see these are actually their flowering stalks that as the leaves die back, these flowers will shoot up and then it'll create like a nice like white onion, uh, round globe shaped flower, and then they'll produce seeds. And then the leaves totally die back. Um, so because they only have a very short season in the spring to grow, um, they take seven to 10 years before they're able to produce that flowering stalk and reproduce. So when people dig up the bulbs, um, and especially if it's like, you know, a decent sized plant, you're harvesting a plant that's probably close to a decade old. So that's how um, they can be over harvested because we harvest old plants, um, you know, unlike a dandelion root that's maybe one, one year old or, um, but so it's easy to harvest a lot and really slow the patch down. So I only harvest just the leaves. So in the early spring before the flowering stalks, you know, like a few weeks ago, we were out picking leaves and each plant, you know, produces multiple leaves. So you can harvest like on a, on a plant like this, you just go around with a pair of scissors and just clip like one leaf per plant. Um, and they, and then because they have a good bulb in the ground, um, they just come back every year. And so I've been harvesting, you know, so many pounds. I harvested 72 pounds of leek leaves this year from the same patches that I've been kind of harvesting from for, and you'd never tell that we were there. Um, you don't have to even wash them. The like, I'm like digging the roots. It's a lot messier because you don't have a bunch of dirt. You haven't disturbed the soil. All the little baby uh, plants that are like these small ones. Look here, Chris, take a look. These are, these are leeks. Um, this is really great because we, we brought these plants in maybe seven years ago. And so these are seed plants that drop seed. The seed lay dormant for two years. And now these little baby leeks are just coming up. So these plants are probably a few years old. Um, so when you're not digging bulbs, you don't have to disturb any of those little guys. And then we just harvest the leaves. So what we do with the leek leaves, I will dry the leaves. We chop the leaves up and put them in apple cider vinegar. One of my favorite condiments in the whole world is I just take wild leek leaves and I puree them in a food processor with olive oil and then I freeze it into cubes oh and yeah this is my favorite too and then I just have this jar it's not really pesto people it's it's maybe the first step of making pesto but I don't have any cheese I don't have any nuts it's just leek leaves and olive oil and then I just keep a jar of it in the fridge and it's basically the most useful cooking ingredient so like I want to make a really quick and easy garlic bread, bread, a little bit of leek paste, um, a bit of cheese, throw it in the oven. Like if I'm cooking and it's like basically almost like having a jar of minced garlic in the fridge that I can just pull out. So instead of, especially in the spring, I'm not even eating much, uh, regular garlic, cooking garlic. I'm just using a lot of this leek, uh, leek leaf paste in anything where I would be adding just like a clove of garlic. I add like 
a little spoonful of this leek paste. Um, really easy to throw in uh, a pasta as well. That's uh, We did that one just the other night. So we made up like a normal pasta with a bunch of cut up veggies, but then we just put a couple spoons of the leek paste in there to add that beautiful leek flavor to it instead of using garlic. Yes, yeah, so the leaves are incredibly easy to work with um, and it is my favorite way to, um, to work with leek because I don't, I know lots of people who work with bulbs and um, and if you have a big property with, you know, acres and acres of leeks. Um, but for me, I find the leaves more versatile um, and I, I just really like them. So yeah, follow our leek or check out our leek post if you'd like to learn more in depth about leeks. Um, it is a really important species uh, to, to just learn more about before you're harvesting it because it's a native species um, with a little bit of a like controversial information about whether or not we should be harvesting them or not. But I believe that done sustainably, leek patches can absolutely support all of us with delicious food. Awesome. Well, let's walk over and check out the nettle patch next. Um, haven't had any more questions come in. So if you didn't catch this already, uh, we would love to hear some questions right now. Um, so we're going to walk, walk over to the, the nettle patch. But in the comments, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook right now, please, uh, please share your questions. And I'd also just love to know, you know, we've never done this before. So this is kind of new for us, the whole morning coffee plant walk. Uh, as some of you know, we run plant walks throughout the year here at Wild Muskoka. And our plant walks are already sold out all the way to October with a huge waiting list. Um, so there's no possibility to get on them this year. So we thought, you know what, that'd be kind of fun just to like do a live stream and share a few plants with folks. So if you're enjoying this, just let us know in the comments and we'd love to hear. Oh. Here, Laura, uh, someone just asked, how many leek leaves do you use for making the vinegar? I'm going to come over here and just sit down for a sec. We're almost at the nettle patch. But do you want to just share? Yeah, how many leek leaves do you use in the vinegar? Can you want to explain that process a little bit more? Yeah, um, so you could make, we're right in the sun here, Chris. Oh, let's do it this way. Better. Um, so from a small handful of leek leaves, maybe like a cup or too chopped, um, I could make like a 250 to 500 mil jar of, of vinegar, which would be quite a good good amount for you to do for the year. Awesome. Yeah, and if you haven't, uh, if you didn't get out to harvest wild leeks, just know that we do have wild leek vinegar uh, in organic apple cider vinegar ready to go on the website. So if you go to uh, our website, wildmuskoka.com, we've got that. We also have the spring the spring foragers box that we just launched for the first time with our spruce tip vinegar, the wild leek vinegar, our wild salt, and our um, gamasio spice. Uh, and if you enter wild spring, you'll get 10% off. Um, you're very welcome for answering the question. If anyone else has a question, please throw it in the chat. We're about to walk over to, I think, the last plant that we're going to cover this morning. Uh, so we're going to talk about another favorite of ours, nettle, uh, that we've been allowing to grow wild on the homestead here. Uh, and I'll just do a quick little spin there. So this is actually just back behind our compost there. I don't know if you can see. So our, we just walked through our garden. So there's the garden kind of behind me there. And in this back corner uh, behind the compost, we've just been letting the nettle go wild. And this is another favorite edible of ours, just chock full of very nutritious things. So we're going to let Laura talk a little bit about nettle right now. Yeah. So um, this is definitely one of my top favorite wild plants. Um, so we did try to cultivate it, but it's like a rebellious teenager in some ways, like in Muskoka here, it wants to grow where it wants to grow and not where I tried to grow it. And when it shows up, it brings all its friends. That's where the teenager analogy comes yeah. from as well. <laughs> Grows where it wants to go and it brings all its friends to the party. Yeah. Metal. So I have just let the metal now just grow where it wants to grow. And this is where it wants to grow next to the compost. So nettle is also stinging nettle. So I wear gloves when I'm working with nettle. So I'm gonna harvest one here. This patch um, is perfect. This week I will be actually cutting this entire patch down. And one of the incredible things about nettle is it's a perennial. So it comes back year after year. Um, and so it also, you can trim it. Um, so here's, here's the nettle. So it grows on these firm stems. And then if I, I don't know how close I can get. And if you can see that it is covered in these tiny, tiny little hairs. So those hairs are what stings you. So what they are is these hairs, if you looked at them under a microscope, they would look like a little tube of glass. And inside 
those hairs is a little bit of formic acid. So that's the same thing that if a red ant bites you, you get they bite you with formic acid. So that's what's so when you brush up a bl- up against this plant, you break those hairs, and then the formic acid comes in contact with your skin, and that's what gives you that like burning, stinging sensation. So the plant is covered in these. So what makes this plant different than a poisonous plant, let's say like poison ivy, is that's an oil. Um, don't mind the rooster. He likes to call a lot in the morning. Um, but so the an oil in a poisonous plant like um, poison ivy, or if we're talking about a plant like in the carrot family, with giant hogweed, um, those are saps, those are oils in the plant. So you can't, um, you can't dissipate those by working with them. Now with stinging nettle, that formic acid, because it's just held in those little tubes and it's really easy to break down. As soon as you crush this plant or steam this plant or cook it in any form, you know, even blend it up for, for pesto, it breaks that formic acid down and renders it totally harmless. So this is how we can eat a plant that stings us if we just come in contact with it. Um, so we will harvest um, the young. So I eat stinging nettle before it flowers. I almost think about stinging nettle as two different plants. Before it flowers, um, to me, it's a food. After it flowers, um, it is basically to me like a, a medicine that I'll only work with as like a tincture or a tea. But this time of year before the flowers, uh, and people are asking, what do the flowers look like? The flowers would come out from these leaf nodes and they would come as these little, they, they're not like a showy flower, like that violet flower. They are like an inconspicuous flower. So they, they, it's almost like it's like little strands of green pearls um, is kind of the easiest way to describe the, the flowers. Um, so I see no sign of, of little like sets of balls forming from the leaves. Um, so this is the perfect time to harvest them for the greens. So I trim, I trim them back. Um, I often will leave one set of leaves at the bottom. And then what's so great is that the nettle will keep shooting up over and over and I'll get multiple cuts from nettle during the season. So I harvest these. Um, I can dry them right on the stem or you can trim them off the leaves. Um, and it's basically just the leaf that we want. Um, and I'll, so I dry them and that's what's in the nettle gamassi that's in the spring foragers box. But the other things that I'll do with it is I just harvest the leaves and then I will do a quick blanch um, in a steamer and then squeeze them out. And then you can like freeze those leaves and use them. I use them anywhere that you would use cooked spinach. So lasagnas, spanish pita, in any type of like frittata or omelets or like you can use um, stinging nettle greens and they are like pound for pound, 10 times as nutritious as spinach, incredibly high in iron. Um, so that's one of the benefits of them. And they're perennial green. So I don't, unlike spinach that I have to plant every year, nettle comes back on its own every year. Um, and so I can just like keep getting this nutritious green over and over and over. Um, so that's why we do multiple cuts. So I'll get, you know, a good, as long as I, I keep them trimmed back, I'll get multiple cuts of these greens. Um, and then, yeah, as long as you cook them, they're hard to eat plain. The only way that I eat them raw is in like a pesto. So I will throw the leaves in a food processor and blend them with oil. And then that's where I'll add like some Parmesan cheese and some nuts. Um, and make a really nice pesto with them. The, the same trick that Laura mentioned with the leeks, if you were watching that part, works great with uh, the nettle as well, too. You know, if you blend it in with the oil and make the paste, and then we freeze it in ice cube trays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's so easy. Like, when you're ready to go make a meal, you just b- basically pop out one of these little ice cubes of the nettle and oil. Uh, and then you can, again, throw it in the pasta or throw it in your eggs, uh, throw it into a soup, for that matter. Uh, spread it on toast, whatever you're doing there. Yeah, a little different, though. I feel like... Uh... I'll just say that the wild leek is that strong garlic flavor. So when I'm cooking, I'm using the wild leek more like a spice Mm -hmm. where this is going to taste more just like spinach. So it doesn't have that really same like, you know, pungent like flavoring. So this tends to be more like the vegetable. Um, Yeah. So you just want to say so, but we still use it the same way because it's delicious, but mm -hmm. it's not, you're not using it as a garlic substitute when using the Mm -hmm. nettle. You're just basically adding the nutrient value. So it's more like adding a green 
to that pasta as opposed to adding the garlic when we're doing it with the delete. Yeah, that's why when I make that nettle gamasio, I had the sesame seeds because the sesame seeds really bring that like, you know, rich um, flavor alongside the like almost there's almost like a salty ish flavor um, to nettles. Um, and then after they flower, when they get larger in the season, um, you can still harvest them and you can make tea and all different types of medicines. I won't get too much into all of the incredible medicines that um, are like health benefits from a medicinal perspective of nettles. Um, maybe that's a video for later in the year. Um, but this time of year, nettles is a, an incredible um, food source. And here, um, I had to kind of grow them, cultivate, but I know in Southern Ontario and in you know other parts of people are here from Vermont and maybe in other places nettles and in Europe nettles are like one of the biggest weeds um so in a lot of places people really uh disparage nettles because they kind of overtake areas and I think how incredible that we have a plant that is incredibly abundant um and it's an incredible food source so here we are purchasing you know greens and plastic clamshells when we could actually be getting incredibly nutritious food that's growing like a weed all through our properties. The other thing to think about, you know, from a, a self-sufficiency and a self-reliance perspective right now, you know, one of our big passions, and I'm sure everyone is thinking about food prices right now, thinking about uh, inflation, supply chains, uh, and thinking about like, you know, how do we be a little bit more food secure? Um, like this huge patch of nettles. So lettuce, for example, or kale, you know, we have to plant that every single year. So it starts by putting a seed in, you know, a pot under a light. We're using electricity to start the seed. Uh, we're growing it under lights and then we bring it outside and we have to amend the soil, which means we're bringing in soil from another spot. So there's a lot of labor that goes into a lot of our veggies, kale, lettuce, all of them really. And there's a lot of impact, you know, because we're having to bring out outdoor resources. This massive nettle patch behind us here, we don't add fertilizer to it. You know, we don't have to seed it each year. We don't have to bring anything. It just comes back perennial on its end. So I think starting to think about working more with perennial crops um, in, in our gardens really makes a lot of sense from both a self-reliance and a sustainability perspective. So I kind of wanted to throw that point in. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything more about nettle before we do our last plant? I just remember mm -hmm. we, we should maybe say a couple things about dandelion. Sure. We did mention it. So mm -hmm. if, if you have any questions about, oh, here we go. Um, I'm just looking at some questions here. I always wondered how to harvest and prepare nettle. I buy dried nettle at the store, mm. but know that I have it growing locally and look forward to harvesting some of my own. Yeah, I hope that helped you and that you feel a little bit more confident with how to actually harvest and use just it now. Just with scissors, just with scissors. And when you when you cut it, um, so if this is the plant like out of the ground, let's say, just, and if you see a set of leaves, like where the ground, it's a little hard to film on the ground. So I'll just demonstrate it here. So where those sets of leaves are, and you just would trim above that, above where the leaves are, so that those leaves, if this plant was still attached to the ground, the plant will keep growing. You would actually send out two different shoots, and then all you do is trim with the scissors, and then that would be your nice nettle top that you could process. Uh, you know, you could just dry it for your tea like you've been buying, or you can just eat it, um, like cook it up and, and eat it like this. Just wear gloves when you're working with nettle. Let's see. When I use, I'm reading questions from the comments here. And if you haven't asked a question yet, go ahead and throw one in the comments there. Uh, it says, when I use dried nettle, it doesn't seem to have any flavor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but I use it for the nutrients. So that's not a question, just a comment. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, that's what I was getting to. It's like, it just basically kind of tastes like spinach. I, I have friends, you know, who eat, drink nettle tea and I'm kind of like, oh, I normally, if I drink nettle tea, I typically add like peppermint or like other herbs with it because I find the tea pretty much tastes like spinach water. Cool. Well, let's go for a little walk over. We're going to cover our last plant here. We've gone a little longer than we uh, we had planned, but that that's normal for us. We get all, you can tell how excited we get about this and how passionate we are about plants and self-reliance and exposing people to this. If you haven't uh, liked this video yet or commented, uh, we would really appreciate uh, you doing that um, because it actually helps that uh, more people see this. So whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, if you can like, and if you could actually comment, let us know if you're liking this as well. Uh, this is our first time doing this, so if you would like to see us do more of these, then then share in the comments and, and let us know that you're you're enjoying this cast. That would mean the world to us. So let's go over to our last one, our um, our dandelion here. Yeah, so we are in the vegetable garden. Um, I work with dandelions so much that this year we saw this bed that was full of dandelions, and I decided to let it 
B. Oh, the sun's right behind you. I'm going to go oh. on the other side of you. Let's I'm on the other side. Perfect. Okay, let's try this. First time live streaming. We got to, we're still figuring out our systems here. So we are here. I feel like I need to like get down so you can like there film. We there we go. How about that? Yeah. So this, this garden bed around us um, is largely dandelions that I'm actually going to let go in our vegetable garden this year so that I can harvest the roots when they're nice and big this fall. Um, but we can also work with, so dandelion probably don't need to describe it. Uh, identification too much for you um, but these beautiful showy flowers that grow on single stems that are hollow um, basil rosettes of, of these jagged leaves so what does basil rosette mean you want to just explain basil that rosette is when all of the leaves grow from one central point at the base so it doesn't branch out and um, send leaves up yeah. We also heard a story recently of somebody that almost harvested dandelion or what they thought was dandelion to make uh, cupcakes or something like that, muffins mm -hmm. with their children. Uh, and it then ends up being cold fun. And it wasn't dandelion at all. So that's what I was going to just say. Though, there, yeah. there are a few things, you know, True. we assume that people know dandelion, but um, we somebody almost harvested the wrong plant with their children. Uh, and fortunately, Laura caught that. So what, what else might you mix dandelion up with and what would be the key things to just be 100% sure it is dandelion. Yeah, yeah. so coltsfoot's probably the main thing that you would mix it up with, um, which fortunately isn't poisonous, but it, you wouldn't want to make cupcakes from them. Um, so the, the single flower on a stem that's hollow, the stem should feel like a hollow tube. And then the presence of those leaves, those at the base is always important. So coltsfoot, would be a flower on a single stem but there's no leaves with them and the stem would be like very hard and scaly um so that's kind of your main identification later in the season there are some species of hawkweed um the flowers are much smaller than dandelion but compar comparative anatomy isn't my favorite but the the it branches so it would be a tall plant with multiple flowers on a stem with leaves coming off the stem um, so those are hawkweeds, um, not dandelion. So dandelion, single flower, single stem that's hollow with those strongly toothed leaves at the base. Um, that should be good for identification. So this time of year, I'm working with the flowers. So you can harvest the flowers. You can sprinkle the petals and, uh, and make cupcakes with them or um, add them into like icing and just for color you can see they're actually growing here with these incredible johnny jump ups so the the beautiful perfect color real combination here of purple and yellow um really helps to attract the pollinators um this is why i couldn't kind of chris was saying about the lawn and i'm so even in the garden i was like this is too beautiful i can't harvest this this year so i'm letting these guys go so the the flowers, I'll just add to lots of things. You can also fritter the flowers. So one of my favorite ways to do is I'll harvest the flowers. Um, I'll make a little batter. I'll do lemon and egg as the wet and then panko as the dry. Go. Oh. Dogs get, there's a chicken laying an egg. Yeah. So Marley likes to bark every time the chicken lays his eggs, yeah. which is good. He's, that's her his protective eggs. instinct. Or sorry, her <laughs> eggs. Yeah, but it's, it's always funny. He yeah. still hasn't figured out that it's not a predator. It's just the, the normal egg laying. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we fritter the flowers. Um, there's different ways you can batter them too. Um, the unopened flower buds um, that I often get when I'm harvesting like some of the roots. Uh, those unopened <laughs> tight buds I love to work with and make pickles, little capers from them. Um, the, and the roots we work with in our bitters. So maybe, maybe later in the year, we'll do uh, another live stream, uh, later in the year we're talking about roots and we'll show harvesting roots, but yeah. Do you want to just explain what a bitter is really quick, just to wrap it up? That'd be kind of cool. It's very long. Which is the real, no, no, the real short version. <laughs> okay. So bitter, bitter is like a, I mean, a flavor. So we think of things that taste bitter, but bitters as a, um, as a drink mix are an alcohol extract of bitter herbs uh, like dandelion root and another plant that grows in here yellow dock often mixed with some aromatic plants um, so we do one that has uh, dandelion has lemon has lemon balm and a little touch of sweetness for honey and then you use uh, bitters to help support digestion or in cocktails um, to add just really round up flavors so that's the short the short and with the chicken and the dog, 
maybe yeah. this is a good time to wrap. Yeah, we'll maybe do a whole another video on the bitters, but they're a real, real fun one, you know, especially if you're looking for healthy options for summer drinks uh, and non-alcoholic drinks. Um, I mean, you can make the bitters in cocktails, but uh, I love just taking a splash of the bitters and throwing them in some bubbly water. Um, and that's a, a phenomenal way to make a nice healthy drink that feels like you're drinking something alcoholic on a summer day, but it's actually not, and it's very healthy for you. So I think we're going to wrap here. Uh, I really appreciate everybody joining in. Uh, we'll just check the comments here again. If anyone has any last questions or comments, feel free to throw them in there. Um, I'm going to just look, mention the, the forger's box. And then, you know what? I'm going to mention one more thing before we fully wrap for the day. Uh, Laura's rolling here. Uh, but I'm going to just go and show you our mushroom patch really quick. Because uh, as folks know, we grow a ton of mushrooms as well. Uh, and we've actually been doing some courses on mushroom growing at home. So... Uh, our mushroom logs are going crazy right now and producing a ton of mushrooms. So uh, if you're interested in mushrooms, maybe stick around for a moment. Um, but yeah, just to mention a couple of resources, I mentioned that on our website, we have the wild leeks and ramps foraging guide. And it also talks about how to transplant them. And we share some of our favorite wild leek recipes on there. So in the, uh, sorry, in the description, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, there should be a link there. If you want to check out our wild leeks guide, that's totally free. Uh, so check that out in the description. Uh, I also wanted to just mention our foragers box one more time. So this is a new thing we just put together with uh, every one of these products. There's four of them in there has something that we just harvested. So these are things that you harvest in the spring. So we have the wild leek vinegar uh, that we mentioned. That's amazing and stir fries and you can make kale chips with it. And uh, I love it. My favorite is actually the wild leek vinegar on uh, steamed asparagus. We also have our spruce tip uh, vinegar. And Laura mentioned how it's such a nice addition to peanut sauces. Um, and then we have the wild salt, which has the dried wild leek leaf in it and the spruce tip. So it actually has both in it. And then we have the gamasio, which is the nettle we were just talking about, which is amazing on like eggs, on a baked potato, uh, are probably a favorite on popcorn. So if you enter wild spring as a coupon code, you can get a uh, 10% off of the spring foragers box over at wild Muskoka. Anything you want to say before I take them to the mushroom batch, just to close this up? Luke? No, hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about those great spring plants and yeah. Hopefully we'll see you at a, a future walk. Yeah, awesome. And again, if you want to see us do more of these little morning live streams, uh, then then let us know in the comments and maybe we'll keep doing them. Um, oh, that's too bad. Someone just mentioned there isn't a... Oh, no, that's what I mean in the chat. Uh, it's supposed to, if you put it in the chat, to show up here. So... Um, Cool, just looking at the comments there. So I'm gonna just walk down. We'll take a look at the uh, the mushroom patch really quick just to wrap uh, wrap things up for, for the day. I'm just walking here. So I'm not really sure what it looks like on the other end on YouTube. I'll have to go back and look there. I just assumed that folks could uh, put in the chat because and things would come through here. So uh, let's see. And So I'm down here and you can see all of these stacked logs behind us here. And these have all been inoculated with shiitake mushrooms. And right over here, here's some that are just starting to come up and fruit there. They're a little bit waterlogged because it uh, rained so much last night. And look at this one right here. This is called pinning here. So that little bump right there and this little bump there are young little shiitake mushrooms. And these grow big and wide. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you're not familiar with shiitakes, you know, the closer one in the grocery store might be like a portabella. So they grow into these big portabellas. And these logs here, so we inoculate them once. Uh, so we inoculate them in the spring. And we have logs that have been producing mushrooms for eight years now with only inoculating them once. So we literally inoculate them, put them in the woods, let them sit. Eight years later, they're still producing fruit. Um, so if you're interested in mushroom growing, um, you also might want to check out our mushroom growing course. Uh, if you go to themushroomcourse.com, again, that, the mushroom course, we got a course all on mushrooms. So we're going to leave it there for now. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the first Wild Muskoka uh, live stream. Uh, we had a ton of fun. I hope you did as well. Thanks for everybody who shared and liked and commented and did all those things. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Um, I'm going to hit end here. And, yeah, have a great day.